You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Welcome to T Minus Deep Space. I'm Maria Varmazis, and I'm the host of the T Minus Space Daily podcast. Now, Deep Space includes extended interviews and bonus content that takes a deeper look into some of the topics that we cover on our daily program. And you're about to hear my full conversation with former NASA Chief Information Officer Renee Wynn. We talk about her fascinating career, how she translated a long stint at the EPA into working at NASA. And we dive into what she learned and advises on managing risk for space systems. Here's our full conversation. Hey, listeners. Great to be here today. Maria, it's wonderful to be with you and see you again. And uh, so I'm Renee Wynn, and I am the former chief information officer at NASA. And almost exactly to this day, I retired from the United States federal government after a 30-year career. And my last stint was NASA. Oh, and congratulations. Everyone, thank you. I know. Three years I made it uh, and having a blast in this, what I call my performance stage of life. I am doing what I prefer to do. I'm not very good at no because really fun stuff comes my way. And my focus now is all about helping others be successful. Now, people, as the former CIO of NASA, I'm sure a few folks at NASA believed that my job was to make their lives miserable um, as we put into place cybersecurity. But honestly, I was really about their success, which included protecting them from cybersecurity attacks. But a common question that I get asked is, how does somebody uh, who effectively grew up many, many life's milestones were at EPA, and I was there for 25 years, and I worked in the program. I worked in the Superfund program, specifically focused on the cleanup of federal facilities, properties. These are highly toxic properties owned and operated by the United States federal government. And I even worked on, age showing here, five rounds of the base closure. And that was intended to match up cleanup or no cleanup with economic reuse of those areas impacted by closing bases. Uh, And so I worked very closely on land reuse issues uh, aligned with cleanup, Folks know a few of these. Fort Ord out in California, which is now California, is coast-to-coast development. You have Vieques, which is now a place where you can go rent kayaks and go on night tours and see glow glow worms and all that kind of good stuff there. And and those are all former bases that have been used, uh, reused for economic redevelopment. And it was great to be part of that. I learned a ton about balancing, uh, um, I would say, taxpayer money with cleanup purpose. And, and in fact, you know, I went to NASA, right? And they, at the Ames, they have the big uh, dirigible there. And I worked on that because there was a lot of uh, PCB contamination in it. And NASA wanted to put a um, child care center in that one. And we said no. And then we said no. <laughs> And on one of my first visits to Ames, the first thing I did was, where is your child center, child daycare center? And I saw it over there and the dirigible was way off in the distance. I said, yeah, that's great. I'm happy to see that. So I was doing a follow-up inspection while a NASA employee. From all that EPA experience to being the CIO at NASA, I love a non-traditional journey because I'm on one of myself as well. So I, I relate. How did you how did you make that happen? How did you get there? So uh, an odd thing, my first answer is usually, well, I had really good data on how we're treating this planet. And so I need to figure a way off. I needed to find wine and chocolate somewhere else. And NASA was an obvious choice. <laughs> But the the other reason, maybe the less fun reason, was I shifted into operations when I was at EPA, and I fell in love. I loved the cadence. I loved the chaos. I loved trying to figure out how to deliver in complex environments. I, I could probably say I don't know that I ever figured that out, but it was fun trying, and I had some amazing teams in, in both places. And so I loved ops. At about, at this point, I figured probably five, maybe seven years left in my career because I knew, you know, I said, well, I'd probably go to about 60, 62, but then, you know, I think a slower pace might be in order. 
And I uh, said, How, where can I go to be better in the field of IT operations and the blossoming of cybersecurity in the federal government? And at the time, there were two deputy CIO positions open, which excited me, having been the acting CIO at EPA for 19 months. I was tired. So I said, oh, this would be great. I'll just take second chair, cheer them on, do the dirty work, and get out of the limelight. And so there were two positions, deputy positions open. One was at NASA, one was over at FEMA. And, you know, NASA basically got theirs out the door. I applied for it and I went through the interview process and I was selected as the deputy CIO before FEMA even got theirs out the door. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) They took the initiative. Yeah, Right. There's nothing magical about the whole thing. And so I got to NASA and a few weeks after I'd gotten there, the CIO who I knew, uh, he leaned over and he said, hey, would you like to be the NASA CIO? And I'm like, no, I'm good, right? Right, fine. fine. I just got here. I kind of like to remember where the restroom is all the time. When you move buildings, like all the basics, it's like, where's where do I get my water bottle filled? Where's the restroom? At the time, where's the fax machine, right? What if the copier runs out of paper at midnight and I'm the only one here? What do I do? And so I'm still working through these these little important issues. And I, I just, I did laugh. I'm like, ah, no, it's okay, I'm good. I like I like this job. I don't even know this job, but I like it. And he's like, no, 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 no. You, we, we would like you to seriously consider that. Mm, okay. So I, yeah. Yeah, so he didn't want it, uh, or here they didn't want it. (laughs) Well, fair, right? I I left out an important part is he, Larry, was getting ready to retire. And I had known that he moved up his retirement date. And I was I was like, uh, oh. I I, I knew that after we we had chatted a couple of times, and then during the hiring process, we didn't talk because we didn't want to do anything to mar the process. And he had mentioned to me that he was, you know, in that range of retiring. So when I got there, he apparently, in between times, moved up his date. And, you know, I went and I thought about it. I said, well, why don't I actually meet all the people who were my bosses? At this point, I still had met um, some of the key folks. And their response was, that's a great idea. This is NASA. And I'm like, why, why is talking to who could be your boss a, a great idea? That's a logical idea. So I laughed about it. And um, so I went up and met with uh, some of the team that I hadn't met yet. And, you know, we chatted and all that. And when I walked out, Maria, my thought was, you know what? I figured out how to find a job in the United States federal government. I left one agency that I'd been with for 25 years. I suppose if anything goes seriously wrong, I could find myself a final federal job to move on to, as long as I wasn't like blacklisted or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. So I said yes. And, and so started a huge, huge learning curve. Like, how do you move environmental policy operations for a domestic agency to global and off the globe operations? What did you know about space before you joined NASA? Were you were you a nerd for space at all, or just an enthusiast? Zero. Yeah, and I like I I even avoided it. Right there are going to be people that hear this. They're going to be like, "Oh my gosh, how could she?" I and love so, that. I think that's great. Yeah. Right. My dad worked for NASA. My dad was a metallurgist. He had his PhD in metal. I was in probably grade school at the time, or maybe middle school at the time when he got that, I was like, what the heck is that, right? My mom, on the other hand, had the cool job. She was covert operations for the United States government. Who wouldn't smoke it, right? You Who can would explain that one to other on kids, me? but metallurgy is a little harder. <laughs> so. But I didn't know this. I didn't know my mom was covert operations until actually after she died, I knew she was a systems analyst at NSA, right? That you can't talk about. So that was the playground talk because people are like, what, huh? With metallurgy? So much for being able to make it accessible, right? 
So when the NASA, when I moved over there, I realized it's a complicated agency. It only took one meeting to, I was like, oh, that's why my dad's PhD is so important. And that is the harsh climate of space, not just space, but getting into space. You have this get out of your atmosphere force shaking and baking and freezing. And they have all these facilities to test these things out at the Glenn facility. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. And so I put myself on a learning journey. And I basically said, I'm the dumbest person in the room. And in many cases, that was the case, right? Well, you sit in on a meeting, planetary protection. <laughs> Yeah, planetary That's a lot. protection. Right. We're not talking picking up litter. We're not talking, well, we probably are talking clean water and clean air, right? That part I got. But hmm, foreign organisms from space being introduced into the into Earth. What's our first response? Hmm, okay, great. Now, look what all we've got on Mars. One defunct rover two others in operation, and a helicopter that's had over 50 missions. So now you're like, oh, planetary protection. Now I understand it. That was one of the more academic discussions for me, not one that I participated much in, other than to, you know, what what does that mean? Like the engineer or the medical officer next to me, I'd write them my little basic questions and ask them to do it. So I got myself on a learning journey. You got a PhD in NASA, basically. Is <laughs> I went as fast as one could possibly do, which means I couldn't pass a test, but I probably could tell you some pretty cool stories about space. Oh, well, that makes you, well, thank you for sharing your career journey, because I, I think that's really fascinating. And I think it's important for people to know that you don't have to have a traditional like, hey, I graduated in this space related thing and I did a space career and that's how I got to NASA or whatever your path wants to be. Paths can be really, um, really much more interesting than that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so given your background, what you've been doing, I think you are the perfect person to explain why space matters. Cause I bet you've had to give that pitch so many times to so many people. <laughs> and I know many of our listeners might have a sense of that, but you have a much uh, more high level view, I think, than many people might have. Could you indulge me a bit and give me that pitch? Like, why does space matter? Yeah. So let's talk about why space matters, right? So I'm going to dial back a little bit. Let's go back to the sixties and the Apollo era. And I'm doing that because there was a lot of unrest in this country. And when Kennedy, you know, made that moonshot, we're going to put people on the moon before the end of the decade. Remember what was going on down here? Protest the Vietnam War, civil rights movements, equal rights movements were also going around. We always forget to say that one. And so now you want money shifted into space exploration over some social domestic uh, type efforts, right? To bring maybe some some less uh, less chaos going on with less protests, fewer protests. You know, focusing on productivity, being all inclusive. You know, how do we shift to that? And if we're going to space, how can we do both, right? Well, we actually, as a population in America, are pretty good at doing multitasking. And sometimes multitasking doesn't go well, but for the most part, it does go well when you get the right folks focused on problem solving. We set out for space during a very tumultuous time in the United States. So I wanted that as a backdrop because here's why space is important. From that day forward, that point forward, where A, Russia beat us to it, you know, so there's a space race, and there's a bit of that going on again now. Lots of great things have happened. One, there's the economics of space. Let's talk about GPS. How many of us use some kind of mapping for navigation? Our cars come with it. And this is how we safely get from point A to point B. Well, hopefully safely, right? But this is how you get places that you didn't know, whereas you used to have to have those paper maps, and it was always safer if you had a navigator because you're not opening the map up while you're driving. You're pulling over the side of the road so you know where you're still going. Instead, it reads it to you on your watch. Maybe you're looking at the face of your car plate because those are huge now, the screen, or maybe you're just looking at your phone. So you use it to navigate. Well, those GPSs are used for uncrewed ships, uh, uncrewed other vehicles. That GPS is delivering things left, right, north, and south. So now we've advanced so much that GPS has allowed us to go to uh, autonomous vehicles. 
um, in certain industries. GPS helps us with logistics. You know, things get crowded in our sea lanes, believe it or not. And the GPS can, as well as the navigational capabilities in these ports, pull together to allow more ships to be brought in at safe, closer and safer distances. Same thing we do with airplanes. So now you can squeeze more into an area. So the one thing is, is the whole GPS invention and what that's meant to economics. Then there's weather, agricultural businesses, soil, soil moisture, uh, big storms coming, the military. How do I do my operations? How do I, how, how can I do my operations? How do I practice my operations in horrific events? So you can practice what could happen in a special program or something like that. And then there's hurricanes, hurricane predictions. This is, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. So the hurricane swath, let's just talk a decade ago, would be, let's say, a foot wide on the weather map. Um, you're gonna just going to have to imagine this. And so that was a decade ago. We get more and more data, more and more models run by high-performance computings. Now we're shrinking the prediction of a hurricane. Let's say we get it down from a foot to six inches or even four inches. In that gap, that shrinkage, so it would be somewhere between six inches and eight inches, those are people that don't have to stop what they're doing to prepare for a hurricane which is opportunity cost loss and economic losses. They're not closing down. They're not rushing to the gas station. They're not packing up their family, right? So now that that swath is much smaller, preparation can be better because now you're in the zone of highly likely and maybe people will make the decision to leave that zone and that they'll feel as if their preparations are going to be worth something. And that, and that is a huge difference in our hurricane prediction models. And now with greater weather events and they're harsher and that again, preparation saves lives and it, it saves the economy because you can, the faster after you've had a horrific event, climate oriented, the faster you get to recovery, the faster your economy gets back up. And that's good for people that live there. Then you have the fun stuff, right? Space tourism. You can get a balloon ride to see the horizon curve on that. I like looking at the pictures. I don't need to leave terra firma. I don't mind <laughs> airplanes, but I don't yeah. think I need to go. I've flown at 40, 43,000 feet in the, the NASA airplane telescope. Actually, it's also the German Space Agency's uh, flying telescope in that. Um, so that's been very cool. That was high. Yeah, it was cool. It was high enough. And now we're getting the internet, which has certainly made a difference uh, in some of the uh, geopolitical events that are happening around the globe is access to that internet. And access to the internet is an economic benefit to anybody on the ground. And so infrastructure is very different in some of the other countries than it is here in the United States. You know, they can skip generations of that. Um, and then the space internet is just gonna continue to grow and grow. We'll be right back after this quick break. So when we think about these amazing systems in space that we all rely on, what kind of threats are facing these systems? Yeah. <laughs> so, I, well, so we talked about the really fun stuff, right? So, so, so then there's this danger. other part, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm going to start with cybersecurity because that's what that's what I got to learn, right, um, as the CIO of NASA. Uh, cybersecurity is a serious threat to national security and to personal security. So, yeah, satellites can be hacked. So if you're a scientist and you're depending upon uh, satellite data coming down to write your papers or make discoveries or inform your models about space and, and that, then you need the highest integrity of data and you need that assurance. So you don't, you, you need to assure that. And how do you assure that? And that is, is you put mitigations in place to protect from a denial of service, a change of data or other 
events that can happen in, in the cybersecurity world. There's spoofing and that, and we've, we've seen some stories on it. But that can happen at the satellite. Now, some of the satellite stuff to do is on the higher end of cost, but since nation states invest in cybersecurity on the offensive side, let's just assume they've invested properly and, and they can make a difference in those satellites. There's another, this is a cool thing, but it's, to me, it's a very scary thing. We can catch satellites now. We've done it. Yeah, it's so I, wild. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if I can catch it to like fix it, that means I could probably catch it to um, do something nefarious. Yeah, or just deorbit it, right? Just completely just- Yeah, like, just whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, just make your next sci-fi movie about space and cybersecurity. Oh, that's already been done. So, um, <laughs> and I'm not going to say, say anything because I don't want us to get in trouble for endorsements or anything like that. So you have the cybersecurity threats, and those threats are in the uplinks and downlinks, the satellite themselves, as well as your ground systems as well. And frankly, you have insider threat as well, which people always forget to talk about. But um, we have a recent leak, right, from an insider threat and the signs. They're harder to detect than outsiders coming in, right? Yes, yep, yep. So you've got that and you've got space debris with everything, right? We have this awesome piece that happens, but now space debris is getting to be a very serious issue and it's being talked about a lot across the globe. Um, as more countries are stepping in to have space programs, uh, lots going on in Africa and in the Middle East to do these programs because they can catch rides um, from SpaceX and other businesses, right? You can make your satellite and uh, there's several private sector businesses that offer ground systems as a purchasing thing. So now it's the cost of the satellite. What sensors do you want to put on it? What scientific data do you want to put on it and or cap capture with it? And then you create your satellite. So the cost of satellites are going down. They've got the nano satellites, the smaller ones in that, schools do that. So we're bringing down the cost, which is creating great curiosity, but those things die in space. And the countries are supposed to be responsible for it, you know, that, but it was easier na before. Now we have the problem is growing and I think pretty soon it's going to be exponential. And there's no agreed upon norms as yet. I mean, we're trying to get there, but. We are yeah. trying to get to space norms. There are some space norms that are out there. There's a lot of questions being brought up about those space norms or do they fit today's model? And my little pea brain has looked at them and in some cases they hold, but not all cases, because also if you weren't at the table, we sometimes as humans have a sort of, well, I wasn't there negotiating that. So does it really apply or I'm slightly different than that? So there'll be human reasons to not do it. So I think it's time uh, they need to continue the discussions and, and reset the table, talk about space norms in a global world now, both from an economics perspective as well as the way space is operating. Yep, it's time. Yeah. Oh, beyond time, right? <laughs> beyond time. We've been there. So uh, something we had been chatting about before we, we started the interview was the uh, the new, the report that came out recently saying that space needs to be classified as critical infrastructure. Wanted to get your thoughts on that because to me that that felt like a really big move when that report came out. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think the timing is right now. This is... This issue has been talked about a lot in the background for quite a while. And on April 14th, the time to designate space systems as critical infrastructure, that report was issued and a lot of good research went into that one. And just, you know, if you look just at pictures, which are always a great way to tell a story, it boils down to sort of three areas of threats. And, and the report is much more detailed. And actually, it's a very good read, I thought but I'm interested in this stuff. <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes for folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be great to, yeah. to take a yeah. look at this one. And and we'll talk a few, a little bit about some of the dissenting opinions, I think, as well. So there's the in-orbit threats, which I've talked a little bit about from the space debris, cybersecurity threats. But people forget, we have humans living in space, right? Right on International Space Station, we've got astronauts. And the astronauts are from U.S. as well as other countries, including Russia. Humans live in space, and when you get space debris, uh, you got to maneuver International Space Station, and those maneuvers happen more and more regularly. 
And that's, we got it right. You, you know, it, it's just not the thing you want to have happen on your watch. But we have to remember that we've got humans up there and we're contemplating space tourism. And there is that's already started. And uh, the United States, in partnership with lots of other countries, uh, are establishing Gateway, another lab, a space lab. And that, and so again, you're putting these expensive assets which have benefit to humanity. And now you've really got to think about how to protect space differently. And naming it as critical infrastructure is another way to do that. I already mentioned the uplink and downlink and what can happen with that. And it's a fairly expensive proposition, but you know, nation states are doing this on a regular basis. And you even have launch threats and just straight collision. Really, yeah. yeah. And we, you know, things don't go as planned. Um, and you, we, and we've seen that, although we've seen it, was I was say, we've seen, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a learning event. Everything is a learning event. And, uh, you also can have a denial service. Now, a lot of the launch pads are pretty well protected, but people are trying to do these things. And so you've got, always got to be on alert that even if it hasn't been done, you should assume it can be done. And what are you going to do to mitigate those risks? So naming critical infrastructure, because we talked about different ways space impacts our daily lives, the GPS, the weather, internet, and such. And so, yeah, now all of a sudden it really matters. It is critical infrastructure. Human lives can be saved or lost uh, depending uh, on a reliance with a space asset, a satellite, and the data that comes from space and the accuracy of that data. So I think it's time to really start the important debates on naming it as critical infrastructure. But it's going to be hard because space is part of critical infrastructure for some other elements of critical infrastructure because it does already rely on on satellites. And so they've got a debate. Do you pull all of it in in space systems as one collective or leave it in the already designated critical infrastructures and just capture what is left uh, and that. So those debates go on. Um, and so why name it as critical infrastructure? Because we'll treat it exactly as the name says. It's critical to humanity um, and there are real threats. And so we need to be smart about future development and mitigating current risks as best as one can, which is, you know, risk scenario building and things like that, which also creates a lot of economic opportunities, right? You know, people can now, you know, walk in and, and if they love risk, boy, talk about moving into an environment, you know, go into space economy and any number of businesses or the government and any government right across the globe and just be a risk manager. And boy, you're going to have some fun. <laughs> I love that. And I was just thinking, what a great way to wrap up our interview, too, is just like this pitch for going into working in space and managing risk. It, it, it is pretty exciting, honestly, uh, for those of us who enjoy that kind of thing. That is a really great place to be. Space is the place. Renee, thank you so much for walking me through your career, your story, your expertise, and your perspective on why space matters. I really appreciate your time today. Oh, Maria, thank you so much. Make it a great one. And that's it for T-Minus Deep Space for May 6th, 2023. We'd love to know what you think of our podcast. You can always email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in our show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karp, and I'm Maria Varmazes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.